Hey everybody, this is Mood Disordered Mind, and this segment is the follow-up from the uh, question time video that I did, uh, where I asked everyone if they wanted to, if they had any questions, they could ask me, and I would answer them to the best of my ability. Um, and I just want to put it out there that if I missed any questions, or I didn't answer it in the way that was helpful to you, please let me know and I will make another video to um, explain it better or ans answer any missed questions. And if you do have other questions in the future and you'd like me to answer them, feel free to message me and I will definitely do another video. Um, and don't feel that you can't ask things about yourself. Um, if you want to know like my opinion on something or um, you know, just to get my, my feedback about something that's going on with you, you can definitely ask me those kinds of questions. Mm -hmm. Alright, so we're going to start off with question one. And I wrote them down, so if I'm kind of looking to the side, that's why. Um, I just got evaluated two weeks ago, but the medical doctor thinks there is nothing wrong with me. I relate to a lot of the bipolar and borderline personality disorder symptoms. He is trying to get me an appointment with a psychiatrist even though he thinks there isn't a problem. Do you have any advice? Well, I would, um, what are you doing? He's being silly. Um, I would, um, go back to the doctor and I would ask him why he thinks that there isn't a problem and where he came up with his reasoning um, so you can get an idea of where he's coming from can you stop please <laughs> and also um, bring in a list of the symptoms that you have and then be prepared to talk about how they affect you and why you think that you know it pertains to your situation so he can get a better idea of what's going on you know so if maybe you know I, I I wasn't there at your doctor's appointment so I don't know how you guys interact or what you've talked about but I would just make sure that everything's out there on the table and then if he still isn't um, listening to you then I would um, ask for another doctor you know try to find a doctor that is going to um, going to listen to you and really get you the help you need. Um, in my opinion, it's very important that your, that your medical health team, whether it's for mental illness or physical illness, um, that they are supportive and that they, they believe you. Like if you tell your doctor, I think that this is going on with me and they say, nah, I don't think so. That's not very helpful to you. So make sure that you have that the doctors that you see are supportive and are willing to help you and willing to listen to what you have to say. And also when you do get the um, appointment with the psychiatrist, be as open and honest about all the questions that you will be asked because you will be asked about mental illness and things like that and answer truthfully and tell them everything that's going on because if they have all the facts and everything they can better assess what's going on so if there is something going on you know they'll have all the information they need and you'll be doing what's best for you um, also no thank you can I make my video please can you go inside also with the doctor um, I'm sure that it won't get to this point, but if you feel that you're not being heard um, and that people aren't listening to you and you're not getting anywhere, then get yourself an advocate or advocate for yourself. You know, um, make it known that you have a problem and you want help and you need somebody that's going to listen to you. You know, you can you can get an advocate or you can get a case manager. Um, you can get both if you want. You know, but just do whatever you have to do to make sure that your doctors are listening to you because it's very important for your health. You know, if this was a physical illness, they'd be right there on board, you know, but when it comes to, when it comes to mental illnesses, some doctors still, they don't believe that, you know, they 
just the way that they think, you know, it's, it's old school thinking, you know, so, um, I hope this was helpful, you know, if, if I didn't answer the question, it, you know, if there's something more that you need, just definitely ask me and I will try to do my best to help you, so, um, good luck with that. Question number two, what is worse, bipolar one or bipolar two? Well, according to the DSM, bipolar one is the more extreme of the of the um, bipolars because when you have um, bipolar one, bipolar one, you always get full on mania, like you know, you, you definitely spike way up. It just, it, it's going to happen. Bipolar 2, you don't get to mania. You only get to hypomania. And this, now, I'm not saying that this is for everybody. This is according to the DSM, okay? So, not everyone fits in a nice little box. They so don't think that I'm, I'm meeting everybody. I'm just giving you the facts that are out there. Um, bipolar 2, you, you, um, you only get to hypomania. And then if you have cyclothymia, you know, it, it, you barely touch hypomania. You know, you get it, but it's not like full hypomania. And with bipolar 2, you don't get full-on mania, you know. And with bipolar 1, you're more likely to have um, psychotic features, meaning delusions, um hallucinations, bizarre behavior, you know, just, just things like that, where bipolar 2, um, that doesn't necessarily happen, um, but it definitely can happen. Casey, I've asked you already if you would please go in the house. Will you please listen to me? I'm trying to make a video. I still love you. I know you love me, but can you love me in the house? Thank you. Sorry about that. He never lets me just make a video. <laughs> um, yeah, so, you know, according to what the experts say, bipolar one is the worst or extreme, whatever you want to call it, of the two disorders. Um, but definitely, um, please don't think that that is everybody because they're learning that it's not just you fit in this box and then you fit in this box definitely not like that and that's why they're working on the new DSM that's why it didn't come out um, earlier when it was supposed to come out it probably won't come out for a couple of years because they're still working through that um, and there's been talk of bipolar schizoaffective schizophrenia um, yeah I think it's just those three that they actually might mix them together sort of like they do the autism spectrum they might have a, a whatever spectrum, I don't know, mood disorder spectrum, I don't know, but, um, you know, there's talk that they might go that way, but we'll see, and we'll see what happens when the new DSM comes out, because that'll be very interesting to see, like, how much it changes what the diagnosis that we have now, um, so that's a very good question. Question number three has three parts. Part one, oh, this keeps happening, it's windy, do you have anxiety? Yes. I definitely have anxiety. I've always had anxiety since I was a kid. Um, and here's an example. When I was when I was a child, um, I went to this one school and everything was fine. And then my mother and her ex-husband got a divorce, and I had to go to a new school. <laughs> and when I went to wait out for the bus the first day, I went up. I waited but I got very anxious about it because I was so nervous about meeting people and not being liked and, and people making fun of me. Like, I was so worried about all this stuff. And it, the fear of it caused me to have such anxiety that I ran back to my house and I didn't get on the bus because I was so worried. And that happened, like, for two weeks I did that. I just wouldn't get on the bus and I had to be driven to school. You know, I eventually, the only, the only reason I was able to get on the bus was I made friends with somebody who lived, like, right down the street from me, so I was able to get on the bus with her, and that's the only reason that I was able to take the bus, is because I found somebody that I felt comfortable with, 
And that anxiety about getting on the bus never went away until I was able to drive to school in high school. So I don't know what that was about, but those are the type that that's just an, an example of how my anxiety affects me. Like I couldn't even get on a bus, you know, I couldn't get on a bus, but I was able to get on a bus before when I was at my other school. So, I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of factors pertaining to why I couldn't get on the bus, but, you know, I've never really explored that. But that's something I could probably explore. Um, and I just want to mention that the reason I, part of the reason I couldn't get on the bus was it wasn't just anxiety. It was raised to a level of panic attacks. Like, I would have panic attacks because I had to get on the bus. It was horrible. <laughs> but back then they just thought, you know, I was just being stubborn or something and it had nothing to do with being stubborn. I was just petrified of getting on the bus. And I have other like other things in my life that that have that I have such a high level of anxiety with um that I get panic attacks and I can't do them. So you know, it is what it is. Part B, how do you deal with it? Well, as I've gone through life, I've learned to use coping skills. You know, I've learned to, to deep breathe. I've learned to do self-talk. You know, I've learned that sometimes the way to get rid of your anxiety is to do what makes you anxious. And of course, when you first do something that is going to make you anxious, you're, you're going to have a lot of anxiety, and that's okay. But you have to practice at it and practice at it until the anxiety level goes down, and it will go down, but you just have to do it. Now, it doesn't always work, but it works more than it doesn't work. Um, you know, and... I am very lucky to have my mother, um, and she helps me through a lot of things that I have trouble with. Um, I mean, that's what moms are for, right? I mean, I'm 27 years old, but I still need my mom, and I'm not, I'm not afraid to say it. I will always need my mom, you know, it's just, it's just the way it is, you know, to help me through some things. And I know I'll always need my mom because my mother's mother is no longer with us. And there are times when she goes through very, very hard times and she wishes that her mother was here to help her through it because she'd know what to say or she'd know what to do kind of a thing. And having my mother does lessen my anxiety level depending on what it is. But, you know, it, for me, it's just a lot of coping skills and trying to work through that and definitely go into counseling and talking about these things like when I get anxious you know okay say say I have to get on a plane I've never been on a plane and I don't ever want to go on a plane because I'm afraid of heights and I'm afraid the plane will crash okay most likely the plane won't crash but it's just a fear that I have so if I had to get on a plane um what I would do is before I even had to go to the airport I would prepare for getting on the flight you know I would prepare okay this is what's going to happen this, I know I'm going to feel this, blah, 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 blah. And acknowledging how you feel about certain things, if you have a lot of anxiety, it can, it can sort of, like, you know, it sort of changes the way you're thinking because instead of just saying, oh my God, I'm so scared, I can't do this, I can't do this, I'm, I, I, I don't know what to do, you stop for a minute and, and you acknowledge, I'm afraid. I'm anxious right now. I'm starting to panic. You know, and then you can sort of deal with it step by step, you know. Um, and that way, like, if I had to get on the plane, I would do these deep breathing techniques. I would talk to myself. I would acknowledge what I'm feeling and work through that so it wouldn't be such, like, so much that I'm holding inside. You know, start to release. If that makes any sense, I don't know. But that's basically what I do. And I do not take um, medication for anxiety my doctors don't want me taking any anxiety medication because of they don't want me to get addicted to them so 
Yeah. Part C. How did you cope with it after having a child? Oh, sorry. Um, part C. Do you find it to be a challenge? Well, definitely. I find... I find high levels of anxiety challenging because they stop me from doing what I want to do. Um, and it can be very difficult and it can cause panic attacks and, you know, and then, you know, things can just spiral out of control. I mean, definitely, I definitely find having anxiety a challenge. But I'm working on that and hopefully things will um, not be so, I won't be so anxious as um, life, as I go through life. Okay, now, question four has three parts as well. Part A, how does your bipolar affect your job and or schooling? Well, I don't have a job. <laughs> I haven't had a job since uh, 2005. So, I don't know at this point in my life how a job will affect me. Um, but when I look back at, at when I worked before, when I was in high school, um, whenever I go to work, I work hard. I do what I'm supposed to do. I don't goof off. You know, I, I work because that's what I'm getting paid to do and that's my job. You know, I take it very seriously. Um, I was a cashier at a restaurant and I found that job to be like exhilarating because, you know, I got to meet so many different people and talk to them and I don't know I just I think what ha what was going on because this was before I even knew that there was something wrong um, well I shouldn't say wrong I don't think being bipolar there's something wrong with you I just think that it's it's just a different way of being so um, so my way of being at the time I didn't know that it had a name I didn't know that and now that I look back, I realize that I was hypomanic and manic at those times. You know, at those times when I was like, woohoo! You know, I didn't know that. I just thought I was in a good mood. You know, and, you know, it didn't affect it poorly because it always actually improved my performance <laughs> back then, you know, because I was like, yeah, I can do this, I can do anything. You know, it was just the way it was. So, as far as jobs go, Probably that'll be what happens to me because I don't mind working. I don't mind, you know, getting out there and, and doing what I got to do. So, but that is a very good question. And when I do get a job after I finish school and everything, and I've had it for like at least a year, um, I will revisit this question and, and, and see how things go because I'm at a different stage in my life. I'm at a different stage with my illnesses and, you know, I don't know how it's going to affect me. Now, schooling, um, I did, it, um, schooling can be both ways, uh, positive and negative. It can be positive in the sense that I can be very creative, I can do projects, I can write papers, it just, it, it just comes right out, it just flows, um, which is very good, you know, because it's, I like being productive in school, and that, that sort of helps me, you know, if I'm, if I'm a little hypomanic or manic. Um, now the downside is that, um, last fall I had to withdraw from school because of mental health reasons. Now that's, that's the only time that it's really affected me. The last time I had to take off was, um, because I had surgery. So, <laughs> um, was that last fall? No, last fall was my surgery. This previous um, semester, I had to sort of take an incomplete for a class because I was I was going through a lot of problems, um, and that's what how I ended up um, impartial the last time. So I ended up it ended up affecting my performance in school, Mama, um, because I was having I w like I was having mania to the point that it was 
it wasn't fun anymore you know it was affecting me negatively it was making me angry and you know and people don't always see that side of mania the angry side you know they usually see the the happy-go-lucky side just one second yes stop while over there is, 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 is. I know that's why I want to finish this video okay can I finish Oh, we need the cord. Okay, hurry up. It's fine. Let me finish, please. Oh, wow. Ugh. Wow. Kids, gotta love them. Yeah, gotta love them. Um, yeah, so I ended up having to take, take an incomplete for that class, and, you know, basically I let my other teachers know what was going on, and they helped me through the, through the last, like, um, couple months of the semester. Um, you know, and I didn't want to because I was so far into the semester I didn't want to withdraw because then I'd owe the school money <laughs> so I just stuck it out um, I stuck it out but after after this the school year ended I started spiraling down and that's why I was you know hospitalized just recently and stuff so it definitely can have a downside effect but when that happens take the time that you need to get better because if you try to take on too much responsibility and you're not well it's not going to matter because you're not going to get you're not going to get what you need done and you're not going to get help so that's what i'm learning so yes it it does affect my schooling and i'm sure it will affect my job part b how do you how did you find out you had bipolar um, last year when I went was seeing a, my counselor she noticed that over weeks that I was displaying um, manic symptoms of bipolar and she brought it to my attention and I'm like well, what are you talking about I've always been this way <laughs> and um, that's when I went to partial for the first time and that's where I was diagnosed with bipolar and that's when I started to do a lot of um, research on it and um, and find out really what it's about and I realized that a lot of the symptoms that are described um, were the symptoms that I had and I never thought I had a disorder I just thought that I was just weird <laughs> so it's nice to know that there is a name for what I was going through and I'm still going through. Part C, how did you cope with it after having a child? Well, I did not know that I had bipolar after I had my son. Um, now when I was pregnant, I was very emotional, very up and down. Now, of course, emotions are normal when you're pregnant but my emotions were extreme I mean I would get extremely angry or you know I'd start throwing things and just I'd be I was so unhappy and I didn't understand why I was so unhappy you know I didn't know people just kept telling me it's it's the pregnancy it's the pregnancy it's the hormones and part of it yes it was and not to the degree that I was having such mood swings. Um, after I had my son, I, of course I still didn't know, but I went into like a deep depression. And I was not diagnosed with postpartum depression. Um, they just attribute it to, because I, I had been diagnosed, you know, actually I hadn't been diagnosed at that time. With major depression they they just assumed it was just you know depression regular depression um so i really didn't get evaluated or anything like that so i really had no idea of what was going on and neither did the doctors um but now that i know that i have this disorder i have to remember that there are times when my son, my mother, people in the general grocery store, whatever, can trigger me. I have to understand that, you know, because it has happened. 
But I have to remember that just because I have an illness doesn't mean that my son understands that really. He knows that I'm, he knows that mommy gets sick, but he doesn't know what bipolar is. You know, he doesn't even know what his illnesses are really. Um, and the way that I relate to him, as I say, as I tell him, Casey, you know how your brain gets sort of messy and it's just like all over the place and you can't think and, and it just gets like crazy in your head. That's how he understands what I'm feeling. You know, so we, we sort of understand each other on some, on some level, you know, and me taking care of myself and getting and getting the help that I needed was the best thing that I could do for myself in terms of being able to cope with having a child because it's a lot of responsibility to be a parent you know you have you have to really be there for your children and that's the kind of parent that I want to be so the basic coping skill is to stay in college not stay in college uh, stay in counseling and don't just remember that I'm not perfect and just be there for my son and show him love and he'll be there for me so um, that's my answer for that I hope that makes sense all right question five what gave you an interest in social work oh that's a good question well I have always loved to work with people. It's just always been something that has made me happy, you know, just making other people feel good. Um, and when I started in school, I started off with that general concept of wanting to help people. Um, and then, and that's why I got into education. And I started, started with those classes, but then I realized that those classes were preparing you to be a teacher. and. I didn't want to be a teacher necessarily, um, so I took, I changed my major to, to liberal arts, and um, I started taking psychology courses, and I realized, oh, I like this, you know, I think I might want to get into psychology, because that'll be a way to help people, you know, and I've always had this thought of maybe being some sort of counselor, so that's um, why that I, that's why I got into uh, psychology. Now, as far as social work, I had a preconceived notion of what I thought social workers did. Um, I never researched it. I just went on like what you see on TV and stuff, and that's that's not right. You, if you want to know something, you got to research it. Um, don't just believe everything that you uh, see on TV. Um, so once I, you know, I had a friend who was in social work, and she had taken a few classes, and she started telling me about them, and, you know, I started saying, thinking, wow, that, that sounds like something that I could do, you know, um, and so I started researching it, and I realized that social work isn't what people think it is, or at least it wasn't what I thought it was, there's so much to being a social worker, and you get to help people, and, you know, and the best thing about it to answer this question is it allows me to make a difference and that's that's all I want to do is make a difference in somebody's life you know even if it's by making this video and answering questions and people are like well thank you for answering that for me I I didn't know that bit of information or thank you for inspiring me I mean that's that's all it is for me. Even if it's one moment in somebody's life, it's worth it to me. And that's why I'm interested in social work. And last but not least, question number six. What are my hopes for the future? Well, my hopes, and we'll start with school, are that I can finish my degree get my undergrad, get a job, you know, and, and be able to, to be happy with what I'm doing and to eventually get my master's in social work. That is my academic goal. You know, that, that's, that's what I'm hoping I can accomplish. Um, as far as 
my physical health, I hope that I can get to a place where I don't need any more surgeries, where I can beat this pain, you know, and sort of live a normal, healthy life in terms of, you know, how I can function. Because for me, sometimes just just moving at all, it causes excruciating pain in my back. And it's my lower back, you know, where most of your, where you use most of your muscles. And it, it, it can, you know, prohibit me from doing a lot of things. And although I may not be able to do everything that other people can do, I want to at least be able to be pain free or, or pain light, you know, and to not have to have any more surgeries. And for the weight loss program that I'm on, you know, to continue to do that, I think I've kind of hit a plateau because I haven't really lost any more weight. I haven't really gained any weight, so uh, we'll see how that goes. Um, and for my mental health, I hope that I can have more stable days than unstable days, and that I am can be able to not let it let it affect me in my life so much. You know, just to be able to. Um, live my life the way I want to live it and not have to worry so much like that I might become manic or something um, my goal is to to be as as stable as possible so I can do all these things in school and, and everything like that so they all kind of go hand in hand um, you know I just hope that I can be I can be successful that I can prosper with, you know, getting a job and everything, and that I can be a role model to my son, you know, and that I can finish school and, you know, just, just be a strong, healthy individual, you know, that's able to live life. So, those are my hopes and goals and dreams. Um, so, those are the end of the questions. Sorry this video was a little long, but, you know, I wanted to answer them in their entirety, you know, I didn't want to just say one or two words about it and then move on. Um, so this is the end of the video, and um, Casey, would you like to say goodbye? <laughs> no, goodbye. Bye, bye. Yeah, yeah. Bye. Bye. Silly. Stop. Stop. Casey, stop. Stop. <laughs> Calm down. Calm down. Okay. Alright, so it was good talking to you guys, and we will see you next time. Wait, wait, wait. Say bye. Bye-bye. Do you have any school pictures?